Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's uh, online virtual strike. And today we have the theme of supporting climate action in Africa. And we have three awesome guest speakers with us um, who I'll introduce as Sarah Camo, the founder of the Africa Climate Action Initiative, uh, Adan Awale and Natsuki, who I believe work with Sarah on the African Climate Action Initiative. Um, Sarah Camu is working as the coordinator of the Africa Climate Action Initiative, ACAI. And it is a Canadian African project um, network initiative to coordinate and build the capacity of African communities and partners to adapt to and mitigate climate change. Sarah is a change agent and a social entrepreneur. She is passionate about championing for the rights of the less privileged through advocacy and community development. While living in Kenya, she graduated with a Bachelor's of Education in the Arts from the University of Nairobi and worked in various national and international organizations in refugee camps and in the humanitarian field. Through these experiences, Sarah has witnessed firsthand loss of lives and livelihoods and forced migration due to climate change. Um, and before we go into the land acknowledgement, I would just like to do a little introduction as to why this topic is actually important. Um, because the struggles and stories of countries in various parts of Africa, such as Sudan, Kenya, and Somalia, are often left out of the climate change narrative. There usually is a focus on the effects of climate change in the Western world. And this is misguided and wrong uh, because many African countries have been exploited, um, polluted, and degraded in their environments. And they've been expected to deal with the consequences and full brunt force of climate change alone. Uh, so this week's theme of focusing on supporting African climate action is very important because the climate crisis will displace millions of Africans and it will destroy millions of livelihoods and lives. And now I'd like to pass it on to Gabby for the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Patrick. So, um, right before we get into any questions, we'd like to do a land acknowledgement on all of our strikes. So we wish to acknowledge this land on which we are holding an online rally. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, just a quote from Lawrence Hill, the land acknowledgement is about acknowledging the land and unfortunately, alongside indigenous peoples, Black voices have experienced erasure from our textbooks and from the way Canada constructs its own history and narrative. Do we know that the story of African Canadians spans 400 years and includes slavery, abolition, pioneering, urban growth, segregation, the civil rights movement, and a long engagement in civic life? We also acknowledge the privilege of online space that we have and the importance of using it to uplift voices and recognize the struggles that continue today of Indigenous people in Turtle Island. So we'd like to ask this question to um, every time we have a speaker. So how do you place your, yourself or reflect on what the land acknowledgement means to you? Well, land acknowledgement uh, for me is basically appreciating the foundation and the roots and most so appreciating the people and also making sure that their history and their story is never forgotten. It's always retold to the future generations. It is also protecting the, the natural resources. And above all, it is also, it reminds me of, it makes me think of um, an undefiled and uh, uncorrupted uh, way of life culture, you know, that is devoid of uh, hatred of diseases and of pollution that is still um, not exhausted or not, um, the natural resources have not been misused or uh, abused yet. So that is what makes me um, feel when I think about or when I hear the land acknowledgement, appreciating the people, the culture, and even the resources, the natural resources. And a follow up to that, um, any of our speakers can mention this or even Greg as well. What intentions do you have to disrupt and dismantle colonialism beyond this territory acknowledgement? Well, colonialism, colonialism has happened uh, across Africa and um, what it did, uh, it changed the way of life. It changed, um, it led to 
uh, tapping or um, theft of natural resources and um, even uh, abuse that is slavery and um, and uh, and making people feel that they are more um, superior than others, making cultures uh, feel that they are not good and appropriate cultures. So when we talk about uh, colonialism, uh, we're saying that, and it's still continuing, there's neo-colonialism up to now where people think that different races, different culture, different religion is more superior than the other. You know, different resources are more superior than the other. So when you're talking about uh, colonialism, you're talking about how do I disrupt it? Number one is through sensitization, like what you're doing, creating awareness that there's no superior race, there's no superior resource, that we are all equal in the eyes of God. And uh, above all, also to just bring in the aspect that um, that even the way of life needs to be appreciated of different cultures, values, they need to be valued and appreciated. Yes. Agree to everything you just said, not just accepting and learning about everybody else's roots and ongoing struggles, but also celebrating the beautiful parts of our culture, um, seeing where we all intersect. Is, it's a very, very beautiful thing. So to not just have the bar at acceptance, but to have it at celebration and diversity and everything. And I think it's really nice. And um, if anybody else would like to add to that question, feel free. Um, so yeah. I think I'm going to be moving on to the actual theme questions now. Thank you for your answer, Sarah. It's very enlightening. Um, okay, so between Western countries like Canada and countries that the African Climate Action Initiative has partnered with, such as Kenya, South Sudan, Somalia, and the Congo, we see a great difference in the amount of emissions and in the consequences that fall on the people. Could you tell us more a bit about the differences we see here and why people should take notice and help work on these issues abroad? Yes, um, there's a difference between carbon emission and um, climate change, basically between um, developing countries and developed countries, you know, between the Western world and uh, African continents in general. And um, we are talking about um, the aspects, for example, um, the, the, the causes, the developing, the developed world emits more global emission. I'll give an example of um, the carbon emission between an average Canadian to an average Kenyan. An average Canadian produces of 50% uh, more than an average Kenyan in terms of uh, uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission. So what does that mean? It means that um, the carbon footprint left by an average Canadian is much more than somebody in Africa. And um, Africa continent is only, is only, um, has only produced of about 4% of the total greenhouse gas emission in the world, meaning that um, the, the others are actually produced by the developed countries, starting with the US, Canada, China, so what does that mean to Africa? Yet Africa is the one that is mainly affected by um, the carbon emission and climate change. It's the one that is feeling the consequence of uh, climate change in terms of uh, floods, in terms of uh, droughts, and they are actually affected by that. Now, um, Africa continent um, does not have the capacity to handle the climate shocks. In terms of um, um, when it, there are floods, it takes time because it, it requires rehabilitation and um, the resources that you know that are supposed to be put in place to ensure that um, the infrastructures are being put in place and all that. So that means that the developing countries feel the impact of um, climate change much more than than Africa. Then also we have the effects and. Um, the, re, the, the resulting uh, impact of uh, climate change, for example, diseases, malaria, 
you know, uh, pneumonia because of cold, you know, uh, other waterborne diseases caused by floods, you know, malnutrition uh, caused by, by, caused by maybe uh, uh, droughts. So all this again, it becomes now a vicious cycle, whereby initially it was the countries were maybe handling floods, but then there's an outbreak of malaria, there's an outbreak of waterborne diseases, then there is malnutrition and all this needs to be addressed. So a lot of resources goes into addressing the vicious cycle. Yeah. Thank you, that was a very extensive answer. Thank you so much, Sarah. So to our next question, which definitely connects, uh, the pandemic has had profound impacts on the economies of multiple countries, developing countries where many people's income rely on daily wages that are now unstable. What does this tell us about the nature of crises and the importance of doing something now? Uh, pardon, sorry, uh, repeat that question again. No problem. Um, the pandemic has had profound impacts on the economies of multiple countries, mm -hmm. developing countries, where many people's incomes rely on daily wages that are now unstable. What does this tell us about the nature of crises and the importance of doing something now? Well, uh, we've had the COVID lockdown. Please, um, other speakers from ACA, maybe they may want to join in. They may want to feel free also to join in if they want. Um, we have the COVID lockdown and um, that has actually led to many people, um, especially those who've been uh, relying on their daily wage rates. Remember most people in the developing countries um, earning less than a dollar a day. And therefore um, they were unable to, to go out and venture in various income generating activities because of the lockdown. Now some countries out of these also experienced flood like East Africa. They also had floods during the lockdown. So again, this kind of countries were also displaced. I mean, some of the people were also displaced during lockdown. So already they are not able to, uh, to earn a source of income. And then again, there is displacement taking in. So it also affects their food security. And now combine the climate change and the COVID-19 uh, a lockdown and the whole pandemic situation, it becomes now, um, uh, you know, one eating from the other. It is a combined effect whereby uh, there's food insecurity. Um, just the other day, it was reported in a country like Kenya that over 152,000 um, 152, teenage girls between the ages of 10 to 19 years uh, were pregnant you know, during the month of March to June. So what does that mean? That now the pandemic is also causing other uh, things that are also coming up. Yeah. So there is an increase in gender-based violence. So again, these are people, countries like in East Africa, they were just recovering from food. There was locust invasion in around January and now there's also another locust invasion. So already the food security has been affected now combined with the climate change. So it's basically a whole myriad of and cocktail of problems that are happening all over the place. Thank you, that's a, that's a wonderful answer to be honest. And um, we'd also like to direct this question to Natsuki, how uh, the pandemic has had very profound impacts um, on so many different levels. Um, so Natsuki, if you'd like to speak on that as well. Um, I agree with uh, Sarah as well. Um, and also, I think that because we can, we live in Canada, we see the effects of COVID here. And also, Africa, they live on the like, daily activities, and, and those are already affected by climate change. And on top of that, and COVID affecting their livelihoods and daily livings directly. So, we need to be more aware of that effects of COVID or those like economy stagnation and those things are more like visible in those developing countries. Yeah. That is completely true. Thank you for speaking about that, both of you. Um, Greg, if you'd like to leave the next question. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Natsuki. Um, so speaking on uh, like 
uh, you said violence against women has increased as well. Uh, and the next question, um, uh, the African Climate Action Initiative recently partnered with Nelotion International, a group that focuses on women empowerment and part of their work is also on building climate resilience. And now could you tell us more about why it is essential to empower and uplift less privileged um, the minority voices in society and the people who get ignored more and not solely focused on emissions? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Africa Climate Action Initiative firmly believes in working with Africa, you know, the continent and working with and for Africa. That means we empower them, we engage them, you know, uh, right from the whole, during the whole project management cycle, that is in planning and designing projects, in implementing those projects, monitoring and evaluation, the whole project cycle. So what does that mean that uh, when we partner, and Nelson International is an organization that basically deals with women empowerment and especially not just women, but single mothers, you know, because again, uh, women um, face different challenges, especially when they are experiencing um, displacement, food insecurity. But as a single mother, it becomes even much more complicated simply because now you're not only relying, you're just relying on one source of income. So that uh, lady or woman, you know, bears the brunt of uh, climate uh, change and every shock, you know, in a different way as compared to when the family is intact because there are two sources of income, you know. So the reason why we empower the community is that um, we allow them to make decisions. We empower them to make decisions because they are the ones who know where the shoes pinch most. They are the ones, they, they are the wearers of the shoes. Then they are able to come up with projects that they know that they can handle. And, uh, you know, it's about time that organizations stop thinking, uh, you know, blanket support, or, you know, even if it's for gender, for example, for women, but think women as uh, individuals in terms of, um, women, single mothers, women who are in, you know, marriage settings, you know, because different people face different consequences. So as we empower them, we conduct training, we build their capacity, we listen to them, we do needs assessment, find out what kind of uh, recovery or what kind of livelihood, alternative livelihood they want to engage in. Then from there, we are able also now to meet them at that particular point of need. Then we also empower them to meet, uh, to monitor, the, to implement their own projects and monitor their own projects. That way we ensure sustainability of these projects. That even after ACI support, these women are still able to manage those, uh, you know, or uh, even after Nelosian or even after whoever has come and worked with them, that these women will still continue being able to be financially stable, you know. So that is the need, the reason why uh, it is always good to empower, you know, because now you give them the authority that even after you have pulled out as an organization, as a donor, that you, this person will still continue, you know, moving on and their lives will have improved. Yeah. That was a great answer. Thank you. I especially like the, um, the saying, they're the ones that feel the shoe pinches the most. Yes. Very true. Um, I'd also like to direct this question towards Ms. Natsuki and Pimar, if you'd like to answer as well. Pimar Natsuki? Hey, hi, morning. I never got the question. Can you repeat the question for me, please? I can always repeat the question. No worries. So. The African Climate Action Initiative recently partnered with Nelotion International, a group that focuses on women empowerment and part of their work is also building climate resilience. Uh, could you tell us more about why it is essential to empower and uplift less privileged voices and not solely focus on emissions? All right, thank you for that question. Hi, good morning, good morning colleagues. Um, the Africa Climate Action Initiative, we, Though it is headquartered there in Toronto as part of the CAP network, we also ensure that 
the policies and the programs that we are implementing and the persons or the teams or the agencies that we are partnering with, there are elements of, you know, the Canadian government policy, for instance, FIAP. And FIAP in particular focus a lot, you know, in terms of on the minority women, women empowerment. And so therefore, you know, the, the approach that we have taken is that whenever we are partnering with these organizations or these entities, the, the objective, one of the key objectives are the cross-cutting issues really is to ensure that women, girls, persons who are in the vulnerable group, they are given an opportunity for self-empowerment, self-actualization. And the research will show, the statistics, the data will show that, you know, women, especially in developing countries, are predominantly heavily involved in agriculture. And, you know, there is a direct correlation between the agricultural output, agricultural production, et cetera, agricultural sustainability and climate change. And so it can't be a situation where, you know, we are going to be targeting a specific group, let's say the males, and we are going to leave out the females, because a lot of these jobs, a lot of these agencies, a lot of these programs, you know, they need women. And once we can empower women, once we can empower persons who are in the minority group, then we will have more, the outcome, the impact will be greater. And, you know, that's really the driving force, that's really the driving factor um, behind this partnership. Moving forward, moving forward, we are also hoping to ensure that, you know, persons who are in these vulnerable groups, we, we, we build capacity. And that is why we want to ensure that we introduce some technical vocational education and training program, PIVET. Most of the African countries, most of the countries that we are seeking to build relationship with our those that we would have partnered with. They have some TVET framework in place. And so technically what we are going to be doing is that these partners that we are going to be working with, we are going to ensure that the women, the girls, the those persons are given an opportunity to expose to some form of skills and training so that if it is that, and when we move out of the country, that the partners move out of the country, then you will have the local capacity on the ground to continue the project while at the same time, you know, generating some income for themselves as well as for further upliftment. So, you know, technically in a nutshell, that's just some of the reasons, you know, we would have partnered and we would have promoted, you know, gender equality, etc. Thank you. Incredible work you all are doing, like honestly. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'd also like to direct this question to Nitsuki. If you feel comfortable speaking on it. Okay, so I agree with Sarah and Timar. And also I think that because gender-based violence or like discrimination is obvious in Africa, and also they are responsible, uh, women are responsible for like many daily activities, like lots of burdens they have, especially single mothers, they are responsible for everything, like raising a child and then uh, making livelihoods and then making the incomes, everything. So also climate change effect is directly affecting those women particularly those uh, single mothers so this narrow chance initiative is really really important to support to you know making those women like are able to uh, making them able to um, generate income for their kids and then making more like improve their lives and yeah so I think we need to support those narrow chance initiatives. Yeah. Again, uh, maybe just to add, um, women also are affected differently when it comes to climate change, you know, as compared to men, just as I mentioned. And um, we also need to look at when we are addressing some of the impacts of uh, climate change, we need to look at them holistically. For example, women and girls will think of when there is displacement due to floods. You know, many organizations may come in to provide food, you know, or uh, other things. But they, many people will also forget that uh, this woman is also preoccupied with uh, maybe the female hygiene kits. You know, uh, they are preoccupied uh, with other things like where are the children going to sleep or where are they going to eat? What are they going to eat? And um, things like um, preventing malaria, you know. So 
Now, the beauty about uh, working with different organizations is that, as I've told you, is just to ensure that we take the experiences, we do a needs assessment with them, we help them, you know, build their capacity so that they may know uh, exactly what project that really needs to be addressed. So, so much, everybody, for all those wonderful, comprehensive answers. Um, we'll be sharing a video, I believe, now, which Sarah can feel free to make any comments about. Um, so, yeah, we'll be sharing that now. Thank you so much. In May of 2018, something weird happened over the Arabian Peninsula. A large cyclone passed over the Rubahali Desert a massive stretch of unbroken sand also called the empty quarter. It usually looks like this, but after the cyclone, it looked like this. Lakes had formed between the dunes. The desert was filled with water for the first time in 20 years. Then five months later, it happened again. Another cyclone hit. Over the next year, powerful cyclones kept coming out of the Arabian Sea at a frequency not seen in decades. It caused catastrophic flooding in normally dry areas across the region, but especially here in East Africa. Today, the floodwaters have receded, but they left behind a different type of disaster. Millions of locusts. A plague of biblical proportions. The worst in 70 years. Their impact devastating. Unprecedented threat to food security. There's no end in sight. This is a desert locust. It's a type of grasshopper that lives across this area from Northwest Africa to Western Asia. Typically, desert locusts spend most of their time alone in what's called their solitary phase. They only really meet with others to mate. But if the weather starts to shift, that can lead to a transformation. If a normally dry area becomes unusually lush with vegetation as it would after heavy rains, these insects will start to congregate. That sudden crowding triggers a hormone, and the locust starts to change, both physically and mentally. It starts with a color shift, from a muddled brown color to a bright yellow. Its body shrinks and its endurance increases, which optimizes it for flight. Its brain grows, and so does its appetite. This is called the gregarious phase. They eat and breed, leaving their eggs in the damp soil. When they hatch, they form what are called hopper bands, swarms of tens of thousands of non-flying but voracious insects that move together as a unit. Eventually, they develop wings. And once they take flight, it's almost impossible to stop them. Locust swarms ride the wind, which allows them to travel up to 150 kilometers a day. A single swarm can contain up to 150 million insects per square kilometer. Each one consumes its body weight in vegetation daily. In 24 hours, a swarm of that size eats more food than 35,000 people. Since late 2019, East Africa has been experiencing its worst locust outbreak in decades. In 2020, the area has seen swarms as large as 2,400 square kilometers. That's a swarm of insects over three times the size of New York City, capable of eating as much food as tens of millions of people. The swarms of bugs are so thick that airplanes have been forced to divert their course. Billions of ravenous insects sweep through areas decimating acres of farmland and threatening already food-scarce regions with famine. There's nothing left to harvest. There's nothing else that I know how to do. And they're spreading. In February, Pakistan declared a state of emergency. By late May, the swarms had reached parts of northern India for the first time since 1962. And the biggest factor in all this is the weather. Locusts reproduce exponentially when the weather is in their favor. With every new generation, the population increases 20-fold. So if a normally dry area stays wet for a long time, the population will explode. And that's what researchers think happened, starting with the 2018 cyclone. The unusual amount of rain led to an unusual amount of vegetation, which led to an unusual number of new locusts. Swarms formed here in the unusually wet desert and made their way into surrounding areas, including East Africa, which itself had just experienced historic flooding in late 2019 from heavy rains caused by an unusually warm Indian Ocean. A single perfect storm isn't enough to bring in swarms of locusts of this size. It takes a series of them. 
something that used to be really rare in this area. But unfortunately, extreme weather that used to be really rare suddenly becoming more common is one of the hallmarks of climate change. That could mean a future with more cyclones in the desert, more greenery where there once was sand, and more breeding grounds for locusts. Do you ever notice these Sarah, would you like to make any comments on the video? Yeah, sure. And um, number one is that locust invasion just happened in January in us East Africa, and uh, currently also around May, um, sorry June. And um, according to experts, it's uh, indicating that that is uh, the worst that has happened in seventy years. And this has come also at a time when. Uh, those countries are also on lockdown, you know, because of the COVID pandemic. And it has also come at a time whereby um, last year there was a drought and um, also uh, floods that also took place. So now you can see that there are people who are actually now more food insecure than they were. And especially now, um, now the COVID situation is actually making uh, the situation even worse. So what does that mean? And you can see that that is because of the weather, that is because of the climate, uh, that is because of uh, climate change, you know, when things happen. So we as individuals, and especially even here in Canada and in the developed world, and even also in developing countries, we have an honor to start thinking about our, our, our you know, the earth. We have an honor of thinking about the future generation because um, this is not going to stop if we continue the status quo as it is. People will continue being food insecure. And when people are food insecure, they will be, uh, you know, an angry man is a hungry man. So when people are food insecure, they are going to be very angry. And what does that mean? It means that there's going to be an increase in crime. You know, there's going to be an increase in displacement. A couple of years ago, um, many displacements, many migration was as a result of um, insecurity, you know, conflicts. But right now we are seeing that there's an increase of displacement and migration due to climate change. So we are having climate uh, migrants or climate refugees, you know, people moving from one place to another because their livelihoods have been affected. They've been, they've, they've been displaced because of natural shocks. So it's important that as individuals, as governments, as organizations come together and even integrate um, climate change in all that we do. Let us be conscious of uh, our own carbon footprints as individuals. Yeah. Uh, we'd also like to direct this question to Katie. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me on. Sorry, I joined a bit late. I'm happy to, to contribute to the question. I think Sarah gave you a great overview, especially of what we're trying to accomplish um, through Akai. And I think part of that is looking past what are the challenges to what are the solutions to that. So when it comes to the locust challenge, for example, part of what causes locusts to spread so rapidly is droughts, is droughts. And droughts is something that people, especially in East Africa, are dealing with more and more frequently. And so we're trying to think, we're trying to imagine how can we not only support people to manage drought when they're in the middle of an emergency, um, uh, like many people are facing now, emergency for men, how can we work together to find solutions, lasting solutions that are going to decrease the impact of drought? So we're looking at supporting new um, methods of agriculture, uh, regenerative agriculture. And regenerative agriculture um, will help to smooth out the extreme weather patterns that people are facing. So, you know, many people are facing um, too little rain or too much rain um, or just, just rain coming at the wrong times. So if you can, you know, if you can adopt this method of, um, managing the land, focusing on managing the land, 
then you can make a better use of that rain that does come. And so by this means, we're looking at innovative ways of making that possible for people so that people can stay where they are, make migration a choice rather than a last resort um, as it has been. Because once you get displaced, then you're facing a whole range of new challenges. But that is what we're trying to accomplish through ACI, work together, support each other, um, support each other with the tools, resources, and knowledge uh, to be able to tackle some of these problems right at their roots, right at their roots, you know, because they're not going away. In fact, they are uh, getting amplified. And so rather than just managing them, we're looking beyond to the solutions. Thank you so, so much, Katie and Sarah. Um, honestly, I think that these sort of conversations help us understand how much the climate crisis can intersect into so many other problems. So thank you so much for answering. Um, to our next question, I think that this also intersects. Uh, Fridays for Future Toronto is a youth-based group and being based here on this land, we have this privilege of having access to government support and more resources. The dramatic changes the environmental crisis has been bringing to the landscape of many countries in multiple parts of Africa. How does this impact youth? So climate change has been one aspect that uh, has actually affected the youth. You know, when we were young, we used to be told that uh, the youths are the leaders of tomorrow. <coughs> no? And now looking back, you see climate change coming to affect the livelihoods of people. Youths are unable to access education. The same youths, by virtue that they are not able to access education, especially during displacements, or when their parents' livelihoods, you know, like what you've seen in the video, when the food crops have been eaten, they cannot harvest anything, so they are unable to sell, you know, food in the market. That, that, what does that mean? That they didn't earn an income. So you find that now even their education is greatly affected. Now youths also, if their livelihoods are affected, their parents' livelihoods are affected, they're unable to access education. They're also unable to access good quality health and sexual reproductive health, you know, uh, access. So all that again is affected. Then now we start a downward, um, a downward curve whereby if youths are affected, they are unable to access their livelihoods. Then what happens is that um, they become, um, they, they, they join, end up joining, you know, criminal activities. I remember when I was working in um, Kakuma uh, refugee camp at some point, is that um, we used to see a lot of increase in crime, especially when schools were about to open. Because by that time, now schools will actually, the youths will go out, attack vehicles, you know, uh, shoot at vehicles just to rob so that they get money for school fees and get money for pocket money, you know, and that is where that used to happen a lot. So you can see now they come up with ways or vices that, you know, so that they can have an alternative also way of, you know, of earning a living which may not be good. So again, that affects the security of the area and all that. There are cases, especially in the northern part of uh, East Africa, that is the South Sudan um, and um, Kenya, Uganda, you know, communities, whereby even youths, when they want to get married, they have to go and do cattle wrestling, you know, steal from each other cattle and all this. And uh, these are communities that are already affected by drought so much such that we find that there's always a problem with that. So it's always imperative and it's always important that um, um, the policymakers consider youths, especially when it comes to addressing uh, issues of climate change and see how climate change affects the youth. For us as SCI, we have various awareness programs and also we have come up with a with a program, a program that is supporting youths to come up with innovative uh, ways of uh, addressing climate change. Just the other day in, um, in Kenya, we saw one guy who came up with um, a way of charging phone, but you know, the phone, and uh, he put um, uh, the phone in, um, in the bed 
so that when the couples, I mean, the, the charging system in the bed, and so that when the couples are um, uh, copulating or having their, you know, what couples do, uh, they'll be able to charge the phone. That is an innovative project. We've seen uh, people coming up with projects whereby uh, they charge phone using bicycles as somebody is pedaling bicycles, you know, it's also able to charge phones or uh, solar battery, you know, and so many other things. So we want to give youths an opportunity to come up with innovative programs you know, uh, to be able to come up with innovative programs. Like um, just the other day, we also saw one that came up with a solar hand washing, you know, put a solar in the uh, hand washing facility, but uh, solar with the solar so I live, Like how do I live? <clears throat> Thank you, Immaculate. Um, so what happens is um, as we are, Thinking about empowerment of youths, we should be able to think that we need to have the youths uh, empowered and also to address, uh, to be part of decision makers when it comes to, um, the, the youths need to be part of decision makers when it comes to making decisions and also implementing and uh, planning for climate change before, during, and after, you know, the natural shocks. Yeah. Thank you. I don't know whether so Kwame's has something to say or Kerry, or Masuki or anybody else. Yeah, Kwame or Dimar, anyone would like to add on to that? You're completely allowed to. Okay, let me let me just um, continue from where um, Sarah Sarah ended uh, with respect to um, youth youth involvement in um, in the climate change uh, discourse. Uh, whichever name uh, you want to uh, take it from, I believe my colleague said decision making. Uh, but even before that, we have to look at um, education and, and empowerment because um, and information. Uh, information brings about uh, transformation. And so um, from the angle of the Pan-African Center for Climate Policy and what we contribute uh, to ACI is to ensure that um, young people are well informed about decisions that um, affect or impact uh, their life, and we do that uh, through um, working with uh, primary schoolers uh, right up to uh, the university level on uh, climate change um, education initiative from empowering them to be able to, like uh, Sarah rightly said, uh, be involved in the process uh, itself. Um, I was listening whilst I was coming to the office, I tried to connect. Uh, with my with my phone, but I believe that my name, the name on the phone, the phone name actually confused the host, so I was blocked. But I find a way to um, connect again with my phone directly uh, using the call in dial, which um, which went in successful. So I was following up on the on the discussion whilst whilst I was driving. I think that uh, my colleagues um, Sarah, um, Natsuki, Tima. Katie, um, I think the contributions they made so far, it's, it's, it's beyond mind blowing. It tells us how far uh, ACI has come. And also um, I want to say a big thank you to uh, Fridays for Future and the amazing team that you have. I've been part of your, your campaign at Queen's Park. It was amazing. Uh, the Mel Brumet Sarah mentioned that we're having this uh, discourse. I was very happy because I know uh, the value that this conversation will, will make. So yes, uh, I want to thank all of you for, for, for having this platform going and hope um, you would, would have, not, this, it wouldn't, this wouldn't be the last, but many of such, such uh, initiatives uh, will, will come up. Sarah made mention of um, colonization, talking about colonization and new, new, new colonization and how that in itself uh, affects um, uh, climate um, um, injustice, how that impact climate injustice. I also want to include that um, I think Africans and like many other minority groups, uh, we travel a lot more than any other um, um, race in the world. And when we travel, we bring not only um, our ideas, but we also bring our, our civilization as well. Um, we, we love to travel. I, I can tell you that there are instances where African African has to sell their entire land, maybe 200 acres of land, 
uh, 300 acres of land, properties just to travel. And sometimes they come and they, they are not even able to recruit the money that they spent in selling the land to be able to travel. Okay, so that tells you what we bring on board, the kind of sacrifices uh, as a result of being adventurous or trying to see what is in other parts of the world, uh, the commitment that we, we, we have to go through to kind of um, um, get to this part of the world and the ideas that we bring uh, to, to the overall uh, governance in, 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 in Western countries and other parts, in other parts of the world and how colonization uh, has effect uh, impact that that process. I'm trying to kind of um, create that impression that once you travel, it is the end of it is the end of the world for you. So just just to support uh, to that part of the piece that Sarah Sarah was talking about. And um, overall, like I said, um, we're very happy uh, for this for this kind of conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so so much for all, all these comments. Um, I can say also, Ashtag was so so great to you all. We learned so, so much and had an incredible conversation. Um, if anybody else would like to comment on this as well, you are more than welcome to. If not, we'll move on to the next question. Well, I, I want to comment on that. Um, the, the global pandemic that, you know, we, we currently face is right now also put into perspective the need for food security. The need for food security and you know there are countries both developed and developing countries that are struggling in terms of ensuring that there is ample food security in place to feed the population and this put into perspective the importance of climate change you you, you can't have you know a sustainable um, chain of food supply if you are not going to be addressing the issue of climate change. And that is why, as an example, the team here at ACAI, what we have done also is that we, we would have looked at the Africa Union 2060, the you know, 63 agenda. And as part of that, they, they, they are, they are, their, their continental education strategy is focusing on agriculture and climate change because they have realized the importance between between agricultural sustainability and climate change. And so what we here at ACI, you know, has been talking about and has been doing is to ensure that the partnership that we are going to form, the partnership that we would have formed, you know, there are clear indication in terms of youth involvement. Because the youth, they are the ones who are going to be making some of these policy changes and they have to be actively involved. And so, therefore, some of the persons or some of the team that the agencies that we are hoping to partner with will be able to deliver, you know, information in terms of climate mitigation, sustainable agricultural practices, food security, and all this information will be made available to the youth, to persons who would have completed post-secondary education, and to those persons who themselves have not had the benefit of a formal education system. And that is where, you know, we continue to reach out to our African partners because we are of the view that once we can get the youth involved to, have to be the, the advocate for the persons who are supposed to chant the way and to ensure that persons are knowledgeable about the impact and the dangers of climate change, then, you know, once we are able to have that system in place and that framework in place, we know we'll be able to have even more meaningful change. And so going forward going forward that is why we continue to review our system to ensure that the youths are actively involved because at the end of the day at the end of the day if the youth are not involved then you know we are actually going to be having a gap we are going to be having a deficit and we don't want to get there thank you so much for all those comments um somewhat of a follow-up question which i know we've definitely touched on already but um, how can these impacts on youth lead to political instability and conflict? When youths are not engaged in, uh, in any livelihood activity, you know, they, they form guns. We've seen that happening in, um, across Africa, um, across East Africa, where there are various um, gun related, you know, uh, crimes. And uh, these youths are also used by the politicians especially during election time, to cause mayhem, to cause people, you know, uh, to change their voting pattern. You know, again, that we've seen happening. 
So also I mentioned the issue of insecurity. You know, when youths are, um, their livelihoods or their families' livelihood is affected, then it means that um, they will also engage in various vices, including like what I mentioned about cattle wrestling, you know, um, carjacking and um, just robbery and all that. So it is imperative and it's very important that um, even um, climate change actors, you know, various actors from the government to organizations and even the private sector that they need to incorporate also the youths when it comes to addressing climate change. See how they are affected. As I mentioned, different people are affected differently. Different genders, different age groups, you know, are affected differently. And we cannot just have a one size fits all uh, adaptation or um, mitigation effects, you know. We have to think of how are this age, what, what is this age cohort uh, and how are they affected? How is this other age cohort or this gender also affected? How is this uh, family unit affected? Because as I mentioned, a uh, single mother is also affected differently from a household that has, you know, both parents, you know, a community. Uh, pastoralists, how are they affected differently from agriculturalist, you know, uh, groups? So when we address this, then we'll be able to address um, climate change holistically. So as SCI, we have actually come up with those programs. And as I mentioned, our bedrock for SCI is needs assessment because in needs assessment, we are able to address now issues as per the age, as per the gender, as per their various diversities, you know, as per their community. Because even in a country, there are various tribes, different cultures, and you know, each one practices their own way of living separately from their, differently from other people. So as SCI, we have put that in, into place and um, we have factored the aspect of really need doing a proper needs assessment. Thank you so much for all those comments. Um, we are definitely all grateful for the entire group of youth that ECA has given. It's really so, so grateful. So um, next question to Greg, I believe. Thank you, Gabby. Um, so one of the final questions what are other societal issues or factors in play that mainstream media often miss in relation to how climate change affects other countries and people? Anyone can answer this as well. So I'll start and then I'll give the others. So mainstream media usually misses out the indirect impact of climate change. You know, they'll talk about the floods but they'll not talk about the mental well-being or the psychological well-being of the farmers. You know, the social aspects. When we see families disintegrating simply because their livelihoods was affected. So mainstream media will talk about climate change, but they will not relate that to the increase in gender-based violence or human rights abuse, you know? And uh, there, is, there is a need to actually have this interconnected because if uh, a farmer will plant, they put in resources, money, fertilizers, inputs, you know, into planting. And then their crops fail. Then what does that mean? That farmer is not going to just sit down and say, you know, thank God, uh, let's wait for the next season. They're going to be disgruntled. You know, because the source of income that they actually expected was actually affected. So what does that mean? That means that um, they will not be able to, to, to be able to eke out a living, you know, and support their families. Families, you know, disintegrate. So mainstream media is actually not relating those two. And we need to have documentaries, you know, observations based on that. The mental well-being, you know, the psychological aspect that comes with... Um, with failure, repeated failures, especially countries like um, East Africa or other countries, African countries where they have repeated pattern of droughts and uh, floods. You know, also there is need for mainstream media to start hyping their fact that we need to mainstream climate change in all aspects of um, all our SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. You know, integrate climate change with education because it affects education. 
integrate climate change with quality health, integrate uh, climate change with infrastructure, integrate climate change, you know, with the eradication of poverty, you know, and uh, gender equality. So when we integrate and mainstream all aspects of climate change, not just having climate change as just one component, climate, we need to have it, you know, cross-cutting in all areas. Then we'll find that various actors, various uh, players, even education players will start now thinking of how do we integrate climate change in this, even the health aspect. Because whenever there is um, climate change, it means that even the health conditions of people are affected, you know, malaria, bilharzia, uh, pneumonia, you know, all these diseases, waterborne diseases, malnutrition. So then if the health sector can also start thinking about uh, climate change and the effects on the population, then we'll be able to see climate change being addressed holistically across the board. Yeah, thank you. And somebody else can add, Lauren has not spoken and Kerry also, or may, many others. And then, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. I, I also want to look at the, the disconnection between um, non-governmental organizations, uh, uh, climate change activists, advocates, and the mainstream. Um, as we are aware, the mainstream comes in to cover the story. But the mainstream itself has to see it as a part of the civil society organization, where they also have to play a role, not just covering what we are doing. For example, you have um, Fridays for Future event in, um, in Prince Park, and you have the media coming in to come and cover it, and then give a news and try to get some viewers and all that. I think we have to engage them as a, as a collaborative partners so that even within the media outlet, they should have a special segment that talks about climate change. Right? That is what we have to encourage. By so doing, they will be well informed and be able to report on the issues just like Sarah has mentioned in all the different facets. But once we leave them to come in just to come on, you know, take the news and go, they'll always miss some of the important uh, 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 pieces that in my op opinion are the, very, are the very fundamental issues that the mainstream media should be involved. So there's a, there has to be a way of us involving them, bringing them into the table and including them as partners because we can do our work and especially having government to live by its words. You need the media to drum on it, to take them by their words. And that's why we need them to be part of the process and not just seen as an outsider covering, covering the story. Thank you. I, I, that, was, that was a great answer too, both you and um, Sarah. And um, if anyone else would like to speak, I'll leave the floor open for a little longer and then we'll move on to the next question if no one else wants. Okay, I'll just make a quick contribution. This is Katie. I think um, the media has done a great job of reporting on climate change, especially recently, but it is talking about the symptoms. So what it's missing in this case is mostly the causes and the solutions. So in terms of the causes, I think one big cause, that will be the way that, that we as human beings manage um, our lives, our production systems, the way we manage our land, the way we manage our food production systems um, and the rest. Uh, there is a big source of the problem and that is, and the source of the problem is where we should focus the solutions. And that's the second part is talking about solutions. So when it comes to the work of ACAI, um, our position is that there are solutions already underway all across the continent. All we need to do is drive support behind these solutions. You know, you have plenty of, plenty of innovative people, plenty of innovative people who need support um, and they've got, the, they've got the answers, they just need some tools. And so I think that, uh, and in many, in many cases, some of the solutions are low cost and are just a matter of changing the way that we approach the problem, the way that we, the way that we look at managing 
the problem. And so I think the more that the more the media can get on board with the good news story, um, I think the more positive momentum that we can build, the more that we can actually get done. And of course, I said that these issues are complicated, they're complex. And sometimes, you know, a sound bite is not going to be able to communicate that complexity um, properly. So you get the headline and then you need to dig down um, a little bit deeper um, and get the real complexity of the issues and the people who are behind it um, and the people who have the solutions too. So that's what I would add. Thanks for the question. Thank you for the answer, Katie. And would anyone else like to answer before we move on? Well, can I chip in something? Yes, sure, go ahead, Tony. Go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Just, uh, I'm Laurent. Um, just to compliment to uh, what Katie have said a few minutes ago uh, regarding the role of uh, the media um, regarding the issue of climate change. I think uh, it's important to look at the aspect of training, capacity building of journalists. Uh, most, most program and projects uh, will need to collaborate. Uh, with national institution in charge of media to make sure that journalists are involved in the development of their knowledge on issues regarding climate change. And as well as we know, in most of countries, uh, partnership need to be developed between ministries of environment or those in charge of climate change with the media. Because uh, sometimes making programs or advertisement uh, awareness campaign um, on TV costs a lot of money. And usually we need uh, to develop that partnership between those technical institutions with the media, and have a number of journalists that are able to do now communication for development or communication for climate change. That will help a lot uh, in making the issue uh, well what's happening. Um, I'd like to add um, at the beginning of when I've joined the, um, the meeting, she was talking in shoes. Um, yeah, in fact, is that where Akai is standing in uh, most of countries in Africa, where um, after uh, assessing the need uh, of the population, after having a look at the vulnerability aspect of those population, then uh, the project idea will come from the need and risk assessment in those communities that are vulnerable. And that will help to have a proper appropriation mechanism when the project is implemented, designed. They are involved in formulation, they are involved, they implement, they are involved. And even when project finishes, they are able to continue uh, with those activities because they have it involved from the beginning to the end. That the gap that we have observed with many uh, partner of development where wrongly designed projects where the end beneficiaries are not involved from the beginning, usually the mechanism of appropriation is difficult. And uh, other aspect I wanted to uh, chip in as well uh, regarding uh, vulnerability of women and girls in African communities is the issue of access to land. Uh, some cultural communities um, they do not allow the women to have plots of land. Uh, in 
also a crisis, you will notice that um, because of shortage of food or water, um, the, the, the fact they migrate. When we leave the community for three to six months, they will go somewhere else where water is available to produce the crop. And leaving the community with only women, little child, old men, and those who have a specific vulnerability aspect. And those issues as well create a kind of um, inequality in the community. And those are issues that are due because of the climate change. Then on the aspect of security, we need to add terrorism on it because where uh, communities are facing issue of terrorism, for example, uh, most of time, they do not have access to the natural resources and the ecological services that you know, the forest or waters can provide to them. They will have difficulties to have access to their land. And therefore it's important when we will be designing projects formulating them or addressing those issues to make sure that that issue of security, the same way the issue of uh, uh, pandemics like COVID-19 need to be integrated together now with the climate change and disaster reduction. And I think, as we said from the beginning, the approach, being in field, working with those communities will help to better understand the need and address it with other partner working in the same field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lauren. That was a very well explained answer. And now I think we can go to Gabby for the final question. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Greg. Thank you, everyone, for these incredible answers. Um, hearing everything that Akai is doing is truly so empowering. And lastly, anybody from Akai can answer this. Uh, how can we support your organization? How can viewers watching support your organization? Yeah. Um, yeah, anybody sure can answer. Natsuki, you want to handle that? Or call me? I think we have like social media accounts, so you, you guys can follow that and also retweet or like, you know, repost or in, on Instagram and also um, what is power. So we can share those like knowledge or everything on climate change and then we can talk in the kitchen or talk in, with friends, family, everything. Those are helping to raising awareness of having um, having challenges in Africa. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kwame, you have something else you want to add on? Uh, Lorraine, Laurent, you are adding. Fatima. Yes, of course. Um... After everything, we, we also have to uh, come to realization that there are organizations that um, ACI is, is working with and are for supporting in Africa. And some of these organizations, um, by, by dint of the operations and the activities and initiatives, uh, we're looking for support in terms of financial wise funding uh, to be able to uh, pressurize uh, most of their initiatives. So that is one of the reasons we have a partnership with the Canada Africa uh, Partnership Cap Network uh, to go to help us to raise for uh, funds to support uh, these activities in Africa. And so, yes, we are open to uh, receiving some donations. We know Canadians are very generous uh, people, I'm very happy. And so, uh, yeah, so through this platform, uh, we hope that uh, we can can get us support to support our initiatives across Africa. So, um, thank you so much, Aden and Natsuki. I don't know whether there's any other person, but you're still free to add. Now, SCI, as Kome has mentioned, is um, under the umbrella of CAP Network, Canada Africa Partnership Network. And SCI, the way we are working, we are working on three prong approach. Three prong approach means that uh, we are working upward stream. 
at the middle level and the downward stream. Now, upward stream means we are looking for partnership with both the private, the public sector, you know, the government, um, other donors who are interested in uh, uh, climate smart agricultural practices or um, capacity building, or even donors, you know, funding both financially and resources. So we want to talk to them, including even government institutions. <clears throat> and those also who are in terms of uh, who are also doing what is called climate finance, you know, so that they can support our initiatives and then we are able to, to cascade this downwards. Now, the second at the mid level, that is partnership with other partners, you know, like minded partners. And this we are talking about people who are concentrating also on things like um, renewable energy, um, various uh, NGOs you know, civil society organizations like the Fridays for Future, Climate Fast, you know, and uh, Energy Mix, and quite a number of organizations that we've been working at PAC, uh, OCIC, all these other organizations that, you know, we are at the same level, that they can empower us, that they can build our capacity, build our volunteers, you know. We're also looking for volunteers who will also step in to help us build the capacity of this uh, of our partners. At the same time, also, we are looking for people, you know, who will invite us for this kind of speaker, speaking engagements and awareness engagements. That way we are also able to, to articulate issues to do with climate and especially the impacts of climate change in Africa. Then downward approach or downstream approach, we are looking at uh, the various partners that we are working with and their relationship also with other partners on the ground, including their governments, respective governments and uh, other uh, private organizations, you know, at the Africa level and even other areas that you are working with. As you know that um, Africa Climate Action Initiative is a combination of eight organizations. I think I need to mention them because without them, we are not us. And um, one of them is a uh, park policy um, that is uh, Pan Africa climate um, that is represented by Kwame here. We also have Win Partners that is represented by Lauren. These are part of our partners who are here. They are also a park policy, they're in Ghana, while Lauren, uh, Win Partners, uh, Ghana and Cameroon park policy, but Win Partners is in Gabon and Congo Brazzaville. Then there is um, Neloshan International. Uh, by the lady who just stepped out called Immaculate that is in Kenya and also Child Fund so that is also in Kenya. We have our Somali partner that is Afra Orphanage and uh, it's led by Aden Awale who is also here in the meeting. Um, so he's a Somali partner. And um, we have um, the, our Nigerian partner, it's called Social Action, uh, led by Isaac Osume. And uh, Zakadia, which is Zanzibar Canadian uh, diaspora organization, and um, that is based in Zanzibar and um, in Tanzania. So these are some of our partners. I don't know whether there's uh, any that I've left out. So we have eight partners in eight countries, you know. And um, <clears throat> these are some of our partners. We wish also to thank them for their support, for their contribution, you know, for being proactive, and also for being the um, the eyes and the implementers on the ground. Yeah. Um, thank you so, so much, Sarah, and Kwame and Jesse. We thank you all so much. If anybody else from Akai would also like to mention how we can support it or just more things about the organization, feel free. Um, if not, Greg, you can also finish up. Oh, I did mention we also have a very able, well, you know, supportive volunteers who are Natsuki and uh, Timar who are here, very active. And also we have others who are not represented like Tandip and Juliet. And of course, our founder, our founder also, uh, who's Paul and uh, Katie, who's just stepped out for another meeting. Yeah, thank you. And Lois. If no one has anything else to say, if you do, please stop me. Uh, I will move on to the conclusion if that's okay. Okay. 
So first, I'd like to thank all of you for coming here to speak with us. Thank you, Sarah, Kwame, Natsuki, Adan, Kimar, Lauren, and Katie, who was here earlier. This has been a very informative uh, strike. Well, honestly, probably one of our best ones so far. So I really appreciate you guys coming out here and talking to us about this. Um, and then, I don't know, nothing really too much. If you guys would like to say anything else before we sign off, um, this was a very informative strike. I, I just, I have a lot of information like that's clinking around in my head now. So I don't know whether we are able to take a picture so that we can take a picture for the group and also for our own communications and PR, if that is okay. And if it is okay, whether the people who are not on video, they are able to put a video and maybe you can share that. Is that okay, Greg and Gabby? That's very okay with me, yes, of course. Okay, that would be nice. So thank you so much for, there you go. But I believe you guys will be able to share the, the recording with us. So thank you so much. And for even part of the, the ACI team who are not represented here, I know they would have wanted to be here, including our volunteers who are not represented here. Uh, and also for <clears throat> Fridays for Future. I know you guys are doing a great job in terms of sensitization and um, in terms of going out there and you know speaking it out and we would like you to continue sharing more about not just the impacts of um, climate change but also on the solutions on what needs to be done and SEI is here to provide solutions both in Canada and also in um, we are we are also working in Canada you know and uh, in Africa Thank you. That that sounds like a weekly strike for another time, though. The solutions one, because that'd also be very interesting. Um, and now, I don't think, is there anything else we have to go over before we wrap it up? Or I think this is it. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Have a lovely day. Uh, enjoy your day. Try to enjoy the sun as much as possible if you're having it. Bye. Thank you. Right. And have a good day.